right, well, a first admission, this is actually not part of my doctoral thesis, so I'm really <laughs> sorry. <laughs> um, and thanks for returning after the final tea break. So uh, what I'm going to discuss, broadly speaking, is uh, karja, so treaties between uh, different kingdoms in early medieval Ireland and the legal terms regulating such agreements. So I will first provide a brief overview on the sources, which you will find on the first page of your handout on the top, and then I will go into the text discussing the implications of the legal contents, and you will find bits of text on page two of the handout. Um, before I then conclude with the perhaps most difficult aspect of implemented laws especially, uh, namely their effective enforcement, and that would be page three and four of the handout. So the last third of the most important collection of vernacular legal writing, the law book known as the Shalafas Moor, is believed to have incorporated a now lost legal text that dealt with the subject of Karja, and which was titled Bretha Karti, Treaty Judgments. We are fortunate, however, because we do have at our disposal two fragments of continuous Old Irish text with interspersed glosses and commentary that belong to this text and which are preserved in MSH 318. Then there is further commentary that is slightly more doubtful but may also derive from the same original text in Rawlinson B506. And <coughs> another important text worth mentioning in this relation is Slan Nachire Karje, the immunity of a hostage surety in a treaty, which deals with the enforcement of compensation and which ha has been partially translated into German by Rudolf Thurneisen. And that's the only bit that we have a translation for so far. I will now focus on the first set of this material in H318, which constitutes the primary evidence on treaty relationships, and which gives us a notion of how law could be used in order to achieve reconciliation between political enemies by legally defining their relationship to each other. And this complex process of adjustment and consolidation represented a fruitful ground of conflict and legal breaches because it took time to be implemented and the Irish jurists were eminently equipped to discuss that. Now, the legal evidence offers a unique insight into how cross-border relationships were fostered and vividly displays the use of law for the purpose of advancing changes in the political landscape of early Ireland. However, the legal evidence is not straightforward at all, and the translation, well, let's say the Old Irish is quite beastly, indeed. Uh, but I'm very pleased to offer my first tentative interpretation of the sections, and any comments are more than welcome. So I will start off with terminology. So the Irish term <coughs> karja specifically refers to a pact, a covenant, or simply peace, entered voluntarily between two or more parties and is derived from the term kara, so kinsman, friend. So in old Irish glosses, it is found in connection with Latin pactum, which means agreement. But that term can carry several meanings in Roman law and appears in various compounds. So the pactum de non petendo, for instance, would be a type of standstill agreement or a terminable surrender to enforce any rising claims. But that is a, a bit too elusive to truly fit the meaning that Karja carries in the Irish text, and they have a different take and interpretation on how treaty relationships are established and continued. Now, to be more precise now, so Karja is a term for interterritorial, but also sometimes interterritorial alliances or treaties between two or more Tuatha. And they do mention that up to five Tuatha, and then you get the overking of Ireland. So that's obviously not a historic figure, but it does appear in the sections. Now, the kings of these minor kingdoms who sought to establish such a treaty relationship can pledge their subjects to it at an enach, so at an assembly. And that meeting is held under the authority of the king, so any treaties of this sort are bound by the authority of the king. And these meetings served political, social, legal, and judicial functions. And that is quite different from normal customary law because this is fresh, new, implemented law that you, ne you need to make work in an already existing customary system. So in the long term, a culture was clearly intended to create and maintain a local peace. But cross-border violence could not necessarily or at least not initially be avoided altogether. Therefore, a culture was much more because it also served <coughs> to secure payment of compensation when the treaty was violated. 
and thereby it absorbs hostilities between the kingdoms into the framework of legal arbitration. The observance and execution of such breaches of Karja were bound through the Atira, the hostage surety, one of the three types of surety known to early Irish law, and a position of guarantor often fulfilled by very high status individuals, as we will see in the following. And this is the first reference. So how is the king's character made? The king swears it on his own, namely payment and releasing an archer surety. What is not sworn is that violence may not be committed, but rather, if it is, compensation will be paid. Now that's all in good, but the amount of compensation depended on the specific terms of the treaty and the extent of legal allowances granted to a neighboring to us depended on the form of karja, for there were three different types or degrees of treaty you could enter. So turning now to a closer textual interpretation, we will inevitably confront the schematized nature of the Irish laws and the pleasure the jurists took in categorizing legal concepts into subdivisions that may often strike the historian as legal theorems rather than actual practice, However, as I will argue further, the evidence does display a notion of the continuity of peace treaties and the desire to perpetuate an induced change in legal practice. So it's an active choice. And that's the next reference. A query. How many types of karja are there? Not difficult. Three. And I'm summarizing now. A limited karja and the karja of mutual forfeiture within the territory and the karja of freemen. So as you can tell from your handout, the respective paragraph contains several glosses attempting to explain the underlying meaning of the division. And I haven't been reading them out to give you this triple division, but you have them on the handout. I will now analyze each of these treaties in turn, <coughs> taking account of these glosses. And I will begin with what I hold to represent the highest degree of culture that can be entered between kingdoms. And that will be the Treaty of Freeman. In this treaty, both payment of corp dire, so body fine bergild, and ene clan, so face cleaning on a price, are required. And that would be a clear extension to the allied territory of provisions already operating within a single tooth. However, there's a reservation to this because the bergild was established at a lower rate. So the fixed penalty for homicide within one tooth would be seven kubula, that's the price of a free man, would be 21 milti cows but the Wehrgeld in the culture of Freeman was reduced to only 12 cows. And there's an interesting parallel to this actually in the Dunsatte agreement between English and Welsh communities lying to both sides of a river, possibly the Y, that's late 10th century, and they also reduced the Wehrgeld to half. Then the second form of treaty or degree of treaty below that would be the limited treaty. Now this is a bit of a complex one, so the term for this is art bide, so that's the participle of the verb art which can mean cut off and destroyed, but also fixed and specified. So the dictionary of the Irish language gives the karja art bide as a treaty being subject to fixed conditions or a fixed term question mark. So I for now preferred the term limited karja because it's not just a simple extension <coughs> of legal rights, but it, specific terms apply to it that limit it in some form. And a glossita adds here that what it limits is that any offense only entails restitution or a life for a life. And if that is true, then that would imply that only afkin, so simple restitution, was to be paid for any offenses committed by a person belonging to tooth A in the territory of tooth B, but nothing else, and that would be very low. And the reference to a life for a life refers to the possibility that an offender can theoretically be handed over instead of compensation. Now, the third form, the Treaty of Mutual Forfeiture within the territory, is probably the most obscure one, but also the most interesting one. This third type of karja addresses mutual forfeiture within territory. So that seems to imply that the person from either tooth united in Karja was not allowed to cross the border and go about in the neighboring territory. By consequence, if he did and was captured, he would be forfeit. The Glossida attempts to justify this by explaining this apparent lack of atonement as a circumstantial necessity for fear of theft and plundering. 
He makes it clear that any killing on the frontier was entirely immune from claim so long as it was committed in the territory of the slayer. But if it was committed in the territory of the victim, you would have to pay the full compensation. Clearly there's something odd going on here. If any person crossing the border was forfeited, really what was the point of having a treaty in the first place? These would be the conditions already in place if there was just no treaty at all. And the reason for this peculiarity may be the fact that this regulation did not specifically target any free man, but a member of the FIMA. So a Feni, a member of a marauding troop of warriors, living without the ties of settled community and placed somewhat outside of the jurisdiction. Now, the Fianna were closely associated with the pagan period, and they might be familiar to some of you from the Vita Prima of St. Bridget, where they take an oath to commit slayings and plunder, a lifestyle that particularly bothered monastic settlements and was by consequence openly condemned by the church. Now, it has been argued that they had no status, rights, or kin group, and by consequence also free license to kill, rape, and enslave. Nash, when discussing the literary representation of Fenidacht, notes that, I quote, the turf of the Fian, located beyond settled politically defined territory, is in the wilderness of interstitial areas, where its members live by hunting, ravaging surrounding areas, or hiring themselves out as mercenaries, quote end. However, there's obviously also some indication that they did maintain ties with the community and they were employed by kings or used as mercenary force by nobles. In line with this argument, royal youths are said to have received a military training among the Fianna. Maya notes that they were often proclaimed men expelled from their community, but at the same time praised in songs and stories for their adventures in warfare. And it appears thus that such mercenary enforcers uh, have been deemed, and I'm quoting Wyatt, an essential element of the social fabric, whilst paradoxically posing a dramatic internal threat to social order. And I do have a gloss associ associating these people with men who killed fathers of other people. So we're talking, we're moving into this ambit of outlawry here. By applying this logic, the three types of karja may then be interpreted as a collection of progressive stages in a treaty relationship between two tuatha. The mutual peace commenced with the most elusive type of treaty, where a person, or in this case, and I will argue that in the following, a feni crossing the border could be killed without further legal repercussions. In the second stage, restitution would be due, and the final and highest degree of karja would have been reached when the laws operating within one kingdom were extended, with minor reservations, to the neighboring tuatha. And this could ultimately explain how over kingdoms were able to consolidate themselves and how Irish provinces such as Leinster and Ulster could be politically maintained for centuries. And you have a table on the first page of your handout summarizing the type of treaty with the required payment and the respective enforcement. Now the intent of peace offerings was to solidify the relationship between the treaty territories. However, as can be seen, different degrees of disparate resolution were possible at different times or with different neighboring kingdoms. This leads us to the question what types of wrongdoings were prone to be committed in foreign territory before and also subsequently to the conclusion of such a treaty that they were obviously designed to eradicate over time. And there is evidence for quite a range of offenses, and these very, very clearly hint at a close relation to the previously mentioned fian bans. How many offenses do they commit in Karja? Not difficult. Seven. Slaying and taking plunder and stealing and murder, which is beautifully glossed, theft, slaying by night, and rape of women and arson and satire. All of these offenses entailed a full debt payment, and what this entailed was then dependent on the respective type of treaty relationship. Another aspect worth mentioning here is that commentary in the second set in MSH 318 states that the debt payment depended also on the amount of territories involved in the treaty. And it suggests that the payment decreased when the amount of tuatha involved in the treaty increased. So therefore, when we are dealing with two boundaries, 
And what I think they mean is there's territory A and the boundary and territory B and the boundary. So you have two boundaries, meaning two kingdoms with the march in between. Um, you would have a full debt payment of 12 cows. When you have three boundaries, it would be reduced to half debt, meaning six cows. For four boundaries, you would have four cows. For five boundaries, you'd have one cow and one heifer. Moreover, and this is interesting, onlookers to the crime were likewise punished, but only liable for half debt. And this is interesting because it shows us that public engagement in the preserva preservation of justice was evoked, and that is very similar to processes of implementing coin law, so secular or ecclesiastical ordinances. Now, the most obvious problem in treaty law is the issue of legality when an attacker who came across the border with violent intentions was subsequently slain but in self-defense. There are slayings of persons in Karja which are immune and on without paying their guilt. A man who slays in self-defense and on he comes to truly slay you without you having the ability to separate from him. Anyone who is attacked in order to slay him or he's going to kill him without naming, without recognition, without the power to stop him. Now this case addresses the situation where a man from territory B goes into territory A to commit a violent attack, and hence obviously he would fail to identify himself. And the killing of such an intruder is said to be immune from claim, however, as we will see, only provided certain preliminary legal guidelines were properly followed, otherwise not. And on your handout on top of page two, you have three definitions for the problematic inhabitants who are likely to raid, attack or plunder neighboring treaty territory. And as you can see, there is a direct link here to the FIANA, which refers to an intriguing situation wherein a, man, wherein a man in the culture went to join a Fian band, so a warrior troop of plunderers, that was not under culture. A man of secret departure who goes with people outside the culture, and on who is engaged in secret travel together with people who are not in the culture. A man in the culture who is in the midst of a Fian band without being recognized. Now the reference to the Fian band is intriguing. What are we to make of our men who joined the Fianna in the context of Karja? And I'm happy to quote Fergus Kelly on this. There is a treaty between two peoples, and I think I should probably use you to make this clear. So you are tooth A, and I and the imaginary people behind me are tooth B. And a member of tooth A now kills a member of tooth B. However, the victim is in a war band along with members of tooth C. That would be you. <laughs> and tooth C doesn't have a treaty with tooth A so the killer is not aware that his victim belongs to tooth B and is therefore exonerated from liability so the context in which this might have occurred is then discussed in reverse order in my references here and it provides explicit details on the necessities for such an exemption otherwise it would be too easy because your opponent is dead already so um, the case takes now the view of the member of 2th B, who is in a Fian band with members of 2th C. They are about to carry out plundering in the territory of 2th A, which is for them outside the Karja, but with which he or she, in my case, has a Karja. And they appear to be attacking a house, which very much reminds of the early Irish Ulster saga, Toggle Brynja de Derga. And in this story, Conor had exiled three of his foster brothers to Alaba for their crimes. They had then made an alliance with the king of the Brightons, and they were marauding in Ireland with a large band of followers. And they attacked the Dergas hostel and attempted to burn it down three times. And in the following reference, the group likewise appeared to be attacking a house. And you're now welcome to use that theatrical image for the story. And now that we have it in our mind, we can imagine the following scene. The man in Karja says to the man with whom he goes, do not take me to people within the Karja, in respect of whom there has been agreed a Karja, to carry out the plundering, he says, when he reaches the place, because apparently they took him there anyway. Is there anyone here of the people within the Karja? Let him come out and he shall have protection. 
So it's, yes, <laughs> it's a very nice image, the idea that that would actually happen. Um, so in addition to this initial inquiry, he then had to utter three calls of protection in order to be in the clear fully. If he did not do so, the customary Wehrgeld in force between them was to be paid by him, rendering his action a clear breach of treaty law. If he made the inquiry but failed to make all three calls of protection, his payment would be reduced to half Wehrgeld. And this quite clearly operates on the assumption that he didn't know that the kingdom they were about to befall actually stood in a treaty relationship to his own kingdom. However, if he knew this, and on top of that failed to fully make the announcement, he was obviously guilty and liable to make compensation to the full legal amount. Now when things did go wrong, and they must have on occasion as the examples clearly confirm, how was the enforcement of compensatory payments envisaged and who would execute this? Because we are talking about people crossing the boundaries still, so how do you imagine enforcement happening here? So we are now moving into the ambit of procedure and it is here where we are about to meet some of the most intriguing figures in Irish law. It is well known that within a single tooth, unatoned killings can provoke the kindred of the victim to pursue a legally recognized blood feud to exact vengeance on behalf of the dead men. Naturally, such, such incessant vendettas raging between two kingdoms were detrimental to both of them in the end, and the Karcher was, after all, meant to avoid <coughs> interterritorial feuding by allowing for compensation to be exacted from across the border. Now, the legal text Krieg Gavlach, our primary text on status, 700 AD, leads us to a very important institution in relation to interterritorial feuding and peace treaties, the office of the Ere Efter, the Lord of Slaughter. Now, the Ere Efter is undoubtedly one of the most interesting figures in Irish law, but his only description is found in probably the most obscure section of Krieg Gavlach. And there are three different translations and interpretations of the passage. And Neil MacLeod, who I'm happy to have here, has recently overturned the previous takes offering a fresh and new approach. In the following, I've given you the traditionally accepted reading of MacNeil and the new innovative interpretation and translation of MacLeod. I'm not going to read out the whole thing because it's pretty long, but I'm going to give you a brief summary of both translations. So the two options are as follows. Version A, a treaty is concluded. After this, there is a period of one month during which any outstanding claims are pursued by the Lord of Slaughter on behalf of the victim's kindred before they then come upon treaty. Version two, a treaty is concluded. The slayer is protected by the king who swore the treaty for the period of one month during which he has to forward compensation. If he does not do so, he loses protection and can then be slain by the Ere Echter. Now, you're welcome to take me up on this later on, <laughs> um, but for now, it's um, independent of what interpretation you choose to follow. What is evident is that the Ere Echter ensured a form of vengeance in contained form for the slaying of a kinsman that represented an alternative remedy to compensation. And in all of the sources I'm dealing with here, it is the latter notion of compensatory payments rather than violent retribution that forms the backbone of treaty law. But it's very important to know that the Aaron Echter is there and that he is an entity within treaty relationships that you have to deal with. And the focus on compensation here stands in opposition to this. But how was restitution now collected if payment was offered? So if the ARA actor didn't have to act, what did he do? As indicated previously, the carger was secured by the king's archure, the hostage surety. And as I said, it's one of three types of sureties, the other two being the wrath, the paying or property surety, and the northern, the binding or enforcing surety. While paying and enforcing sureties often appear as collaborators in legal texts, the archery is never mentioned in conjunction with them, but acts entirely on its own. This has led to the suggestion that he was maybe not employed for private obligations. The term itself literally means in between ship, and the surety was really one who stood in between claimant and defendant, and he was the first port of call, so it's an, it's an active abstract term, it's a living term. Um, when any breach of an agreement had taken place, 
it would be the archery that you first approach. And he was, as I said, often of high status, and we do have the heir apparent mentioned specifically as functioning as archer. Stacy has suggested that the archer may have acted like a standing surety on behalf of the whole kingdom, and that he had to be ready to execute any unexpected claims and killings or offenses within Karcher would fall under that category. This would then include that it might have been summoned on several consecutive occasions, whenever something happened. Now, similar types of archery also appear in coin out of nine, Lex Innocentium promulgated in 697. And we know that it features a long list of guarantors who lend their authority to the enforcement of this law and who are said to be archery for a coin a law prescribed by the king or the church, and in this sense very similar to a karja. And thus the archer was the chosen form of guarantor for implementing and securing new laws within a given legal system. And there's a correlation between coin and karja law in the intent and purpose they have, the way they are made and the way they are enforced. They are very closely associated with each other. And I'm, I'm now moving to slan nachere karja. So, it is said here that another dubious figure known as the Murdach from the victim's tooth comes across the border to demand the debt. And I will try to explain the Murdach further on. The first thing he does is to look for the Archere. That will be the Archere in the other kingdom that offended my kingdom. So the Murdach goes over and looks for the Archere. And when he finds him, he says, let me have what is owed from you. And upon this demand, you would expect now that uh, the surety answers, I shall go, says the archery, to the kindred that has committed violence against you. Both should then go to the kindred, and when they reach them, they ask them, Shall we have what is owed from you? If we do not, we shall close in on your guarantor. If the procedure followed the ideal norm, the kindred would then have been ready to make the agreed payment and simply answered the following, you will not need to. You shall have what is owed. And the next step would then probably have been to forward payment and perhaps to offer them adequate hospitality, since they are Karja friends. However, if the kindred refused to pay even after the archer prompted them, the Muradach took the hostage surety with the statement, you are obliged to go with me. And the procedure would then follow the normal standard of the suretyship, which would be that the archer is bound to go with the Muradach, was taken into captivity, usually for the period of 10 days, after which he would theoretically become forfeit. At any point during this period, the kindred for whom he functioned as surety could have redeemed him by paying what was due, and I guess an additional third for the default. If they did not release him, he would become forfeit at the end of the period, or he can release himself. And the archer releases himself by offering a pledge worth seven kuvala, which is the fixed penalty for killing a free man, in order to redeem himself. If he doesn't do so, he'd become another very dubious figure known as Kimbil. It is important to note also that the archer cannot avoid imprisonment, so payment is not a substitute for imprisonment. He has to go through the imprisonment and only after the period he can free himself. An old Irish glossator illustrates the possibility that those who cause a guarantor, who is here explicitly named as the heir apparent, to pay the debts of a peace treaty on their behalf became the clients of the archer, as the kindred debts a thief, and the kindred debts a thief which is not returned. And this is quite an alternative solution. The compensation of the karja, that is, if anyone should cause the archer to pay the fines for a breach of a karja on his behalf, that becomes a fief for which food rent is due from the kindred that is not returned unless the fines are paid immediately with their proper doubling fine. That doubling fine itself is not considered a fief on a client from his lord. Now, a thief in Irish law consisted of a grant of livestock forwarded from the lord to his client, who in turn owed annual food renders. The type of clientship that could not be terminated and which is envisaged here is base clientship, and that would be the far less favorable form. This reference illustrates the inherent pressure deriving from a high status archire and allows us to entertain the possibility that individuals who did not abide by treaty law 
would have been forced into <coughs> submission and perpetually moved under the direct dependence of the heir ap apparent in clientship. Now, returning to the Muradach, that's a very strange figure that is poorly, poorly attested. Tournesen regarded the Muradach as nearly synonymous with the Murrah. However, that's not much help because we have hardly any information on the Murrah also. So, unfortunately, the precise sense of Murrah is uncertain. When it is used as a technical legal term, it does denote a specific social grade and probably the headman of a district or kindred. The activities envisaged for the Muradach remind somewhat of the Ere Echter. He too crossed the border into neighboring Karachi Kingdom to enforce entitlements in lieu of his own people, and he was probably also accompanied by a troop. However, the Muradach did so in a slightly more diplomatic fashion. The fact that he closed in on the surety and actually had the option to force his reappearance by distraint confirms his authoritative but non-violent force of compulsion to redress compensation. And it's also quite telling that he never ever approaches the kindred that offended his own directly. It always goes through the archery. There's no direct contact. So he has certain legal allowance in the foreign territory, but it doesn't extend that far that he would be allowed direct contact with the offending party. The archer is in between. <coughs> and this type of demeanor, especially the possibility of distraint, then reminds somewhat of the Nadam, who also enforced payments of contractual debts within a single kingdom, and who also employed distress, but he additionally was permitted to use physical violence when he faced a reluctant debtor only. Nevertheless, there appears to have existed somewhat of an overlap in the functions of possibly, and I'm speculating here, an adaptation of the Nadam's legal allowances to interterritorial enforcement in the form of the Muradach. At least the Murrah's office carries the distinct flavor of a military leader or officer in command of the division, and that would then bring us right back again to the Ere Echter. So there is an overlap and correlation, but we don't know enough at the moment to say anything more specific. In conclusion then, the regulations pertaining to Karja allowed for three types, or as I would argue degrees, of legal entitlement in a neighboring treaty territory. The impression the sources give is that the ultimate goal and superior alliance between two kingdoms would be the Treaty of Freeman, in which both Vergild and Honor Price were paid for the slaying of a man in Karja. This relationship posed a stable unity in which obstructive forces such as the Fiam bands had been subdued more or less successfully and then extended the legal mechanisms to maintain order and peace, which usually only operated within a single tooth to the neighboring territory and legally united it with one's own. There were several official actors and enforcers at play that held an interterritorial treaty together the Ere Echter, the Muradach, and the Achire Kharti. Each type of Karja reflected a degree of peace operating between Kingdom A and Kingdom B. The enforcers, in a similar fashion, stood for a degree of permitted violence or enforcement duties between the two kingdoms. The Muradach and the Achire collected compensation payments from the kindred. If they refused payment, it was likely that the Achire had to pay in their stead. However, where this system was not in operation or failed to lead to the satisfaction of the terms of a treaty, the Ere Echter entered the scene and enforced in the name of the slain victim's family. The Lord of Slaughter maintained the feud in controlled form, but he already represented, as MacLeod argues, a weakened, a weakened version of the full-fetched blood feud in which the whole kindred, including male and female descendants, had to join. The hostage surety formed a potent alternative once the legal mechanisms that facilitated his authority were fully integrated into the legal operation and political life of the treaty kingdoms. If the archer was the heir apparent of the kingdom, this procedure allowed ruling nobles to subdue those who breached the treaty and were not able to pay by making them their base clients. Thus it facilitated them with a means of bringing disobedient subjects under direct authority, combining economic and political control. 
Now it is hoped that this first investigation has offered an insight into the legal framework within which Carter was discussed in the legal sources and has demonstrated how designated enforcers were employed in an attempt to progressively substitute violent interterritorial retribution with the collection of compensation payments beyond the border, facilitating a consolidation of treaty territories that was legally shaped but also by consequence historic reality. Thank you.